Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm uh, here in the uh, man cave. Um, we have a special uh, Zoom edition uh, update here. It's actually the 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 class of 23 2.0. Would that be the redux? Let's call it the re- like uh, you know like Apocalypse Now Redux. Yes, this is right. class of 23 Part Two Redux. Right. So so Scott dropped this episode and Benny dropped this episode a day or so ago. And uh, there was a, there was a comical moment. Let's just be honest, a comical moment with some uh, uh, miswording of the of the situation. Um, the the Bath Avenue crew is is one of the things we're going to talk about. This is going to be a shorter episode, but that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. And we noticed in the comments that uh, apparently, I think Scott, at some point, you said that the, the Bath Avenue it, boys. <laughs> I think I said it a couple times. I was saying Bath Street boys, which sounded like Backstreet Boys. <laughs> As I was saying it, and I'd actually written it, I, I could tell that there was something amiss, but I didn't go back and do. And I, I know it was the Bath Avenue crew. I've read, I've read all the books. I've, I, I've talked to all the people that you need to talk to. I'm, and I have to be obviously more buttoned up. Uh, you can't make those kind of mistakes if I want to be taken seriously. Uh, reporting on on East Coast New York Mafia. Uh, so I apologize. It's obviously the, the Bath Avenue crew. Um, but uh, let's just jump in. Just like the first uh, you know, solo quick hitter I did, the first class of 2023, where we talked about four um, pretty prominent New York five family good fellas that were coming out of prison in this last couple months. Three Columbos, uh, Joe Monteleone, Tommy Gioli, Tommy Schatz, and uh, Chucky Russo. And then the Lucchese Consigliere, uh, uh, Joe D, Joe DiNapoli. Two more guys hit uh, halfway houses uh, last week. And they're two guys that uh, one is a, a is a fast riser right now. Andrew Campos from the Gambino, Sonny Campos, uh, is a guy that people are uh, predicting will be a, a future administrator in the Gambino crime family. And then... Uh, the Bath Ad, the Prince of Bath Avenue, uh, Fabrizio, uh, the herder, De Francisi, De Francici. I don't know. Fra- I don't want to Fra- Francisi is how I understand yeah. how to pronounce it. So they both, uh, uh, Fabrizio did 23 years. Uh, Andy Campos only did about two and a half. But uh, they're both uh, back in New York City right now. And just uh, shameless self promotion. If you uh, are new to the All Video channel, by the way, please subscribe to us on YouTube and spread the word on social media. But if you're new to our video channel, we have a lot of audio episodes with, with other really prominent guests that uh, you can find on either Apple or Spotify or whatever. And we had an interview with uh, Jack Falcone or, or Jack Garcia, who was an undercover FBI agent who infiltrated the Gambino family. And he knew Campos personally, and he, he had some insight into Campos. So if people want to know a little bit more about that, check out our, our episode with Garcia, we, we should try to get him on our video uh, yeah. show at some point. But uh, you could check that out if you want to learn more about him. Yeah, we talked about Andy Campos in that episode. And uh, he's a guy that has been um, being groomed for uh, big things in the mafia since the 90s, uh, you know, going through some court records and FBI uh, documents related to him. Uh, the, you know, the the family, the Gambino family hasn't been run by the Gottis for well over a decade Um I would say going back 15, 16 years now, 17 years, the, the Sicilian wing of that family has has taken control. But even though uh, Andy Campos, uh, I believe he's 52, 53 years old, he was he was kind of plucked uh, from the street in the 1990s when he was in his 20s uh, by uh, Junior Gotti, uh, Tori Lacasio, who's the, the son of. Uh, John Gotti's conciliary, Frankie Loke, Frankie Locasio, and uh, another guy named uh, Richie Martino, and, and Campos is just like the the definition of the of the twenty first century gangster guy who's really polished, really well spoken, is uh, really tough in in the white collar rackets, but is respected on the street as well. Yeah, my understanding is he's a, a big earner. And that that's one of the main reasons. But people people seem to genuinely like him, but it, that he's a he's a big earner, which will you know that that's definitely important, especially these days. He's connected too. You I mean went to high school uh, and graduated with with Sean Puffy Combs, uh, Mount St. Michael's, I think it is, uh, out of the Bronx. 
And uh, we know Puffy. We've talked about Puffy Combs on this on this uh, pod before. His dad, Melvin Combs, was a, a drug dealer in Harlem uh, under Nicky Barnes back in the seventies. Was murdered. Um, and Andy Campos was the star quarterback of that football team in the class of eighty seven. So it would have been the eighty six football season, I guess. And uh, Puffy Combs was a was a wide receiver, defensive back, and. Uh, you know, fast forward 10 years from then into the late 90s, one was a up and coming mob superstar and one was a up and coming hip hop mogul. It's, do, do we have any understanding? I mean, are they do they socialize with each other ever? They did, back, they, did, they did back then. Right. I wonder if re- more recently, because I, I, I can't remember if I've if I've heard that or not. That Well, they, they were the tabloids were were uh, were writing about him in the late 90s when Puffy was on the ascent. Yeah, when they both were on the scent. Um, yeah. Puffy was was coming into the you know, for the for the youngsters guy for the for the people that might be like let's say thirty five and under, um, when Puffy blasted onto the scene in the late nineties, it was it was saturation, man. I mean, he was all over the place. And this is yeah. before social media, before uh, during the, the infancy of the internet, and yeah. uh, he was just a, a pop culture phenomenon. Uh, so people were looking to write about him in any way possible. And then he got into trouble with J-Lo and the shooting. And uh, in 99, there was a club shooting that he was tied to. Uh, and, and then people were immediately when that happened, uh, a lot of the journalism uh, <laughs> quickly pivoted to what shady underworld connections Puffy might have. Uh, and And I know that, some of his interactions with with Campos came up then in the, in the tabloids. I don't know what uh, you know. A- a- Campos did some time in the two thousands um, with with Tori Lacasio and Richie Martino, and he took this most recent case with Richie Martino as well. Uh, it's it's a lot of white collar stuff in the uh, in the early two thousands, late nineties. Richie Martino uh, was the, a pioneer in in uh internet rackets uh credit card rackets uh calling card rackets uh he really created the template the blueprint for all the five families to to jump you know head first into the you know really the 21st century um underworld landscape and uh they they took a case back then they were they like they invented some internet scam where you would sign up for a porn site. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And they would rip your your yeah. credit card number. Yeah. You, you, you'd try to get back onto the porn site and you couldn't get back on. And then they had your credit card. Right. Uh, Wasn't Gotti Jr. implicated in yeah. that too? Those are those well, right. guys. Well, yeah. So, uh, and then in the last case, which was uh, another kind of white collar fraud racketeering, uh, he was followed going up. Uh, to see Frankie Loke, uh, Frankie Locasio, qu- quite a bit in the in the 2010s, and there's pictures of them in, uh, behind bars. So he was running with top guys, you know, OGs from the old school. Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, it, it, he lives in Westchester, but has his ties in the Bronx. Um, so it should be interesting to watch him over the next decade or two and, and where he's going and in the Gambino crime family. You know, switching over to Fabrizio. That's a that's an incredibly compelling, riveting, riveting narrative of that Bath Avenue crew and what it started out as, what they wanted to be, and then what they ultimately were. Because Fabrizio is the only it was a group of uh, half dozen to a dozen childhood friends uh, from Bath Avenue, uh, Brooklyn, that, that came up uh, under the then conciliary and acting boss, Anthony Spiro of the Bonanno crime family. And uh, after, you know, 10 years or so of, of tutelage, everybody was either dead, in prison, had flipped. But Fabrizio was the last man standing, and he, he was the only one to get a button out of that whole crew. Yeah, well, uh, Tommy Reynolds, uh, he was an Italian. Or at least he, they, couldn't, he couldn't get yeah, one. He couldn't. Okay, and yeah. the, uh, but uh, Jimmy Calandra, there were some, some big names that were in that group. Paulie uh, Brass, Crazy yeah. Joey Calco. Um, yeah. And these guys were it was like, you know, a real life Bronx tale, but but moved into the 1980s. And instead of one guy, 
you had a whole group of childhood friends that were were taken under the wing of Anthony Spiro. And uh, they went from errand boys to collectors to killers. Um, they were doing hits for him when they were just out of their teens. And Pauly Brass, uh, Pauly Galino was, was the leader, and he was the one that um, I think most wanted a button and most wanted to become a, a mob soldier and then a boss. And what happened to him kind of mirrored what happened to that whole crew. And uh, Spiro, his daughter got robbed, her house got robbed. And Spiro gave the contract to kill the guy that had robbed the house to the Bath Avenue boys to kind there of you go. There you go Bath again. Avenue crew uh, <laughs> to, to make their bones. And they, they got rid of the guy. I think his name was Bickleman, Vince Bickleman, uh, Vinny Bickleman. And um, at that point, they all, especially Paulie Brass, thought they deserved to, to get made. And they were beefing with some other JV mobs. Uh, around the area, and uh, Pauly Brass didn't feel like Anthony Spiro was backing him enough in in these disputes, and was telling him to stand down in in, in some rivalries that had developed. And in uh, they, they wanted to, he wanted to settle it diplomatically, and Pauly Galino want he wanted to he wanted permission to to go to war with this other like JV yeah. crew. Yeah, and Spiro wasn't wasn't going to sign off on that. Yeah. And uh, in the summer of 93 is when everything started to unravel. Uh, they got into a, what became, it wasn't even a physical altercation. It was Pauly Brass put his hands on Anthony Spiro and uh, pushed him or hit him. I think, he him. Yeah, I think he shoved him. Yeah. And uh, Spiro just walked away. And it, it wasn't like. He was going to then settle it. He was he was like, I'm going to walk away and I'm going to put a contract on your head and your best friends are going to come kill you in the next couple of days. And and that's what happened. Yeah. Galino seemed that he was on that trajectory to get made, although I think he had a reputation as a hothead. But um, he, he did. He was on that trajectory, but he made a, obviously a fatal mistake. But a couple months before that, uh, there was a, a a botched home invasion that ended in the murder of a. Long Island housewife, and that's what sent a lot of these guys to jail, including Fabrizio. Uh, so it was the, I think it was February of 93, the Shemtov family, uh, uh, Sam Shemtov was a mob associate Jewish guy that that ran uh, adult entertainment type businesses. And there was word that he had uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the safe in his house. And the Bath Avenue crew showed up and ended up killing his wife. T.K. Reynolds ends up killing his wife. T.K. Reynolds allegedly was also the shooter that killed Pauly Brass. And he's the only one that's still in prison right now. He, but he's got an outdate. He'll be out in about six or seven years. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding. But Fabrizio uh, survived all of it. Everyone else, I, I said, they were either dead. Crazy Joey Calco flip. Jimmy Calandra was in prison who eventually would flip. Um, T.K. Reynolds was in jail. Or I don't know if T.K. Reynolds was in jail yet. But uh, Fabrizio got his button in 90, late, according to FBI records, it was late 98 or early 99. And uh, he was sponsored. At that point, Spiro was in prison. I'm not sure if he was dead yet, but he was definitely locked up. And uh, Anthony Graziano, TG, is who sponsored uh, Fabrizio. And Joey Messino made him. Yeah, it's uh, he seems to be the last, uh, you know, last man standing from that from that crew. And uh, we'll see. Uh, it reminds me of the Sopranos episode. That was sort of your, you know, your right. kind of point of departure for this naming these episodes that. And, you know, a lot has changed, and um, I believe he'll be under uh, supervised release for uh, at least, at least one, a few years. years. Yeah, a couple of years at least. Which um, I, I would say, like, um, I think some people who aren't from the streets overstate uh, <laughs> the importance of that in terms of uh, thinking that, that guys totally hide in their basement <laughs> and, and are not communicating with other guys from the street. 
I, I would just say I think things are more complicated than that. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll say more, but I think it's more complicated than that. A lot of these guys are are natural gamblers, both literally and figuratively, and they'll roll the dice. Right. And right. there's there's I don't want to say that uh, you have a good chance of not getting caught, but I don't think it's as like you're saying about in terms of perception and reality, I, I don't think there's as much scrutiny. Yes. Unless you're a John Gotti. Right. Uh, I don't think there's as much scrutiny with who you're running with. But if you happen to be meeting somebody and then there's a surveillance crew looking at those guys, or you have informants tipping off parole officers and FBI agents of who you're meeting with. But, uh, I don't think necessarily every time you leave the house, you've got a tail on you. No, and there's and also um they just don't I have would, the resource. The feds just don't have the resources. They don't have the resources. But I would put this out there that even with if they know that you're vi in violation, this is sort of an example of like tickling the wire. Sometimes sometimes the feds, you know, sneaky motherfuckers. Yeah, <laughs> they, want, they, they, they want they want to see who you're meeting with and like yeah. what, what the vibe is and who you're interacting with. And uh, so even if you're in violation and they know about it, they may not necessarily, yeah. uh, you know, break your balls on that. Just, well, Mancuso, just look at Mikey Mancuso, out there. Look at Mikey Mancuso right now, the boss of the Bananos. Uh, he's facing a, um, a supervised release violation and they waited, I think, a little bit until they uh, put it into a court filing last year and uh he'd been out for three years uh before they uh, let it know let it be known that he had violated and yeah, now of course yeah now they're going back and forth about if he's got to go back and serve time and it's still being strung out but i think mikey mancuso might be a little bit different than someone like fabrizio I think Mikey Mancuso is somebody that if they were going to allocate resources yeah. in New York, those resources would be allocated to people like him and Barney of the Genovese um, and, and, you know, Lorenzo with the Gambinos. I, I don't know if, if Fabrizio, even though he's a, a big deal in Brooklyn mob lore and for guys like us because of the mythology that's kind of developed around that Bath Avenue group, I don't know if Fabrizio is someone who's necessarily going to have eyes on him uh, 24 seven. Yeah. And just from, from talking to sources, I, I don't know about him personally, so I, I don't want to pretend like I, I, I know people that know him, but just from talking to other people about what it's like in the life, a guy like that probably has a lot of respect on the streets because he did his time and he kept quiet. And so, you know, in, if, if there's a situation like that, my understanding is a guy comes home, he has a lot of respect, probably get some some envelopes to help them get going um but a lot of things have changed and, and you know i bring it back to the sopranos i know that's not real but we we you know we saw those storylines with richie april or feach lamana tony blundetto like with guys that do 20 years or more like a lot can change when they let's see when they in terms of the politics of the underworld um and that that's not only within your own family but but other like uh ethnic crime groups that you're interacting with things are a lot different than 25 years ago technology smartphones yeah. so um I, I don't want to just focus on him because because i don't know him and if he you know if he's getting out he did his time if he's trying to turn his life around i i don't want to you know like like libel this guy and pretend like <laughs> you know he's i, I don't he's know what i mean doing. all due respect to fabrizio but he's yeah. a convicted murderer no right 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 but if so if he's if he's not going to be in the life anymore I, whatever that, that's good for him but i'm just saying uh, in general, these kind of case studies, um, it's interesting to see how things turn out uh, because you can't always just step right into where where you left off, especially if you've if you've been gone twenty years or longer. Yeah, just to finish. Yeah, just finishing up. Let's just segue to the Columbos for a second, and I think you, you never know where you're going to slot back in, but it definitely helps you if you're someone like Chucky Russo, who is a part of that Persico Russo mob dynasty. Uh, with the Columbos, it definitely helps you with those those bloodlines. Oh yeah, and he's yeah. only set, and Chucky's only seven years old. So, but uh, last thing I want to shout out: uh, a rest in peace, uh, a uh, an o an OG pod obit to uh, a Colombo OG, uh, Vinny Sicilian, uh, Vincent Gugliaro, 
could have been the oldest member of La Cosa Nostra in America. I'm not positive, but it's a very good chance. Died that last month at, uh, <laughs> at the age of 95. <laughs> he was a capo in the Colombo crime family from uh, the 70s until the 2000s or 80s to the 2000s. Uh, allegedly retired in the early 2000s. Um, but was a guy that uh, rose pretty high in the labor unions out of New Jersey. He was a member of the old Gallo crew that went to war. He, he fought, this guy fought, on, I, I wrote about it. I said he fought on the front, front lines of World War II, and then he came home to Brooklyn and he fought on the front lines of the Gallo War. Uh, so this guy was, uh, this guy was deep in the streets. So yeah. I just to, uh, give a shout out to uh, Vinny Gugliaro and uh, Vinny Sicilian, uh, RIP, 95 years old. So uh, we like doing. I think we're gonna do more of these uh, these mini episodes. I, I like them. These quick hitters. Yeah, it's fun, and uh, yeah, we hope people enjoy it. Again, please uh, subscribe. Please uh, follow us on social media. Spread the word. It really helps. We've got some exciting things coming up. An episode is going to drop soon about the Lucchese Jersey crew and the 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 murder the murder of um, Logano. Frankie and, Logano. Yeah, and uh, that audiences will be able to watch that soon. We've got some stuff on, on New England coming up very soon. Uh, we've got some uh, outlaw biker stuff coming up soon. So so stay tuned, and we appreciate your time. Um, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein, we're out. We're out.